The Voice of the Damned, The Last Feast of Harlequin, by Thomas Lagotti. My interest in the town of Miraca was first aroused when I heard that an annual festival was held there, which, among its other elements of pageantry, featured the participation of clowns. A former colleague of mine, who is now attached to the anthropology department of a distant university, had read one of my recent articles, The Clown Figure in American Media, Journal of Popular Culture, and wrote to me that he vaguely remembered reading about or being told of a town somewhere in the state that held a kind of fool's feast every year, thinking that this might be pertinent to my peculiar line of study. It was, of course, more pertinent than he had reason to think, both to my academic aims in this area and to my personal pursuits. Aside from my teaching, I had for some years been engaged in various anthropological projects with the primary ambition of articulating the significance of the clown figure in diverse cultural contexts. Every year for the past 20 years, I have attended the pre-Lenten festivals that are held in various places throughout the southern United States. Every year, I learn something more concerning the esoterics of celebration. In these studies, I was an eager participant. Along with playing my part as an anthropologist, I also took a place behind the clownish mask myself. And I cherished this role, as I did nothing else in my life. To me, the title of clown has always carried connotations of a noble sort. I was an adroit gesture, strangely enough, and had always taken pride in the skills I worked so diligently to develop. I wrote to the State Department of Recreation, indicating what information I desired and exposing an enthusiastic urgency which came naturally to me on this topic. Many weeks later, I received a tan envelope imprinted with a government logo. Inside was a pamphlet that cataloged all of the various seasonal festivities of which the state was officially aware, and I noted in passing that there were as many in late autumn and winter as in the warmer seasons. A letter inserted within the pamphlet explained to me that, according to their voluminous records, no festivals held in the town of Miraca had been officially registered. Their files, nonetheless, could be placed at my disposal if I should wish to research this or similar matters in connection with some definite project. At the time this offer was made, I was already laboring under so many professional and personal burdens that, with a weary hand, I simply deposited the envelope and its contents in a drawer, never to be consulted again. Some months later, however, I made an impulsive digression from my responsibilities and, rather haphazardly, took up the Miracaw project. This happened as I was driving north one afternoon in late summer, with the intention of examining some journals in the holdings of a library at another university. Once out of the city limits, the scenery changed to sunny fields and farms, diverting my thoughts from the signs that I passed along the highway. Nevertheless, the subconscious scholar in me must have been regarding these with studious care. The name of a town loomed into my vision. Instantly, the scholar retrieved certain records from some deep mental drawer, and I was faced with making a few hasty calculations as to whether there was enough time and motivation for an investigative side trip. But the exit sign was even hastier in making its appearance, and I soon found myself leaving the highway, recalling the road sign's promise that the town was no more than seven miles east. These seven miles included several confusing turns, the forced taking of a temporarily alternate route, and a destination not even visible until a steep rise had been fully ascended. On the descent, another helpful sign informed me that I was within the city limits of Miraca. Some scattered houses on the outskirts of the town were the first structures I encountered. Beyond them, the numerical highway became Townsend Street, the main avenue of Miraca. The town impressed me as being much larger once I was within its limits than it had appeared from the prominence just outside. I saw that the general hilliness of the surrounding countryside was also an internal feature of Miraca. Here, though, the effect was different. The parts of the town did not look as if they adhered very well to one another. This condition might be blamed on the irregular topography of the town. Behind some of the old stores in the business district, steeply roofed houses had been erected on a sudden incline, their peaks appearing at an extraordinary elevation above the lower buildings. And because the foundations of these houses could not be glimpsed, they conveyed the illusion of being either precariously suspended in air, threatening to topple down, or else constructed with an unnatural loftiness in relation to their width and mass. 
This situation also created a weird distortion of perspective. The two levels of structures overlapped each other without giving a sense of depth, so that the houses, because of their higher elevation and nearness to the foreground buildings, did not appear diminished in size as background objects should. Consequently, a look of flatness, as in a photograph, predominated in this area. Indeed, Miracaw could be compared to an album of old snapshots, particularly ones in which the camera had been upset in the process of photography, causing the pictures to develop on an angle. A cone-roof turret, like a pointed hat jauntily askew, peeked over the houses on a neighboring street. A billboard displaying a group of grinning vegetables tipped its contents slightly westward. Cars parked along steep curbs seemed to be flying skyward in the glare-distorted windows of a five and ten. People leaned lethargically as they trod up and down sidewalks, and on that sunny day a clock tower, which at first I mistook for a church steeple, cast a long shadow that seemed to extend an impossible distance and wander into unlikely places in its progress across the town. I should say that perhaps the disharmonies of Miroka are more acutely affecting my imagination in retrospect than they were on that first day, when I was primarily concerned with locating the city hall or some other center of information. I pulled around a corner and parked. Sliding over to the other side of the seat, I rolled down the window and called to a passerby. Excuse me, sir. The man, who was shabbily dressed and very old, paused for a moment without approaching the car. Though he had apparently responded to my call, his vacant expression did not betray the least awareness of my presence, and for a moment I thought it just a coincidence that he halted on the sidewalk at the same time I addressed him. His eyes were focused somewhere beyond me, with a weary and imbecilic gaze. After a few moments, he continued on his way, and I said nothing to call him back, even though at the last second his face began to appear dimly familiar. Someone else finally came along who was able to direct me to the Miracle City Hall and Community Center. The City Hall turned out to be the building with the clock tower. Inside I stood at a counter, behind which some people were working at desks and walking up and down a back hallway. On one wall was a poster for the state lottery, a jack-in-the-box with both hands grasping green bills. After a few moments, a tall, middle-aged woman came over to the counter. Can I help you? she asked, in a neutral, bureaucratic voice. I explained that I had heard about the festival, saying nothing about being a nosy academic, and asked if she could provide me with further information or direct me to someone who could. Do you mean the one held in the winter? she asked. How many of them are there? Just that one. I suppose, then, that's the one that I mean. I smiled as if sharing a joke with her. Without another word, she walked off into the back hallway. While she was absent, I exchanged glances with several of the people behind the counter, who periodically looked up from their work. There you are, she said, when she returned, handing me a piece of paper that looked like the product of a cheap copy machine. Please come to the fun, it said, in large letters. Parades, it went on, street masquerade, bands, the winter raffle, and the coronation of the Winter Queen. The page continued with the mention of a number of miscellaneous festivities. I read the words again. There was something about that imploring little please at the top of the announcement that made the whole affair seem like a charity function. When is it held? It doesn't say when the festival takes place. Most people already know that. She abruptly snatched the page from my hands and wrote something at the bottom. When she gave it back to me, I saw... December 19th through the 21st, written in blue-green ink. I was immediately struck by an odd sense of scheduling on the part of the festival committee. There was, of course, solid anthropological and historical precedent for holding festivities around the winter solstice, but the timing of this particular event did not seem entirely practical. If you don't mind my asking, don't these days somewhat conflict with the regular holiday season? I mean, most people have enough going on at that time. It's just tradition, she said, as if invoking some venerable ancestry behind her words. It's very interesting, I said, as much to myself as to her. Is there anything else? she asked. Yes. Could you tell me if this festival has anything to do with clowns? I see there's something about a masquerade. Yes, of course, there are some people in 
costumes. I've never been in that position myself. That is, uh, yes, there are clowns of a sort. At that point, my interest was definitely aroused, but I was not sure how much further I wanted to pursue it. I thanked the woman for her help and asked the best means of access to the highway, not anxious to retrace the labyrinthian route by which I had entered the town. I walked back to my car with a whole flurry of half-formed questions and as many vague and conflicting answers cluttering my mind. The directions the woman gave me necessitated passing through the south end of Miraka. There were not many people moving about in this section of town. Those that I did see, shuffling lethargically down a block of battered storefronts, exhibited the same sort of forlorn expression and manner as the old man from whom I had asked directions earlier. I must have been traversing a central artery of this area, for on either side stretched street after street of poorly tended yards and houses bowed with age and indifference. When I came to a shop at a street corner, one of the citizens of the slum passed in front of my car. This lean, morose, and epicene person turned my way and sneered outrageously with a taut little mouth, yet seemed to be looking at no one in particular. After progressing a few streets farther, I came to a road that led back to the highway. I felt detectably more comfortable as soon as I found myself traveling once again through the expanses of sun-drenched farmlands. I reached the library with more than enough time for my research, and so I decided to make a scholarly detour to see what material I could find that might illuminate the winter festival held in Miraka. The library, one of the oldest in the state, included in its holdings the entire run of the Miraka Courier. I thought this would be an excellent place to start. I soon found, however, that there was no handy way to research information from this newspaper, and I did not want to engage in a blind search for articles concerning a specific subject. I next turned to the more organized resources of the newspapers for the larger cities located in the same county, which incidentally shares its name with Miraka. I uncovered very little about the town, and almost nothing concerning its festival, except in one general article on annual events in the area that erroneously attributed to Miraka, a large Middle Eastern community, which every spring hosted a kind of ethnic jamboree. From what I had already observed, and from what I subsequently learned, the citizens of Miraka were solidly Midwestern American, the probable descendants in a direct line from some enterprising pack of New Englanders of the last century. There was one brief item devoted to a Mirakavian event, but this merely turned out to be an obituary notice for an old woman who had quietly taken her life around Christmas time. Thus I returned home that day, all but empty-handed on the subject of Miraka. However, it was not long afterward that I received another letter from the former colleague of mine, who had first led me to seek out Miraka and its festival. As it happened, he rediscovered the article that caused him to stir my interest in a local fool's feast. This article had its sole appearance in an obscure fetchschrift of anthropology studies published in Amsterdam twenty years before. Most of these papers were in Dutch, a few in German, and only one was in English. The Last Feast of Harlequin, Preliminary Notes on a Local Festival. It was exciting, of course, finally to be able to read this study, but even more exciting was the name of its author, Dr. Raymond Thoss. Before proceeding any further, I should mention something about Thoss, and inevitably about myself. Over two decades ago, at my alma mater in Cambridge, Thoss was a professor of mine. Long before playing a role in the events I'm about to describe, he was already one of the most important figures in my life. A striking personality, he inevitably influenced everyone who came in contact with him. I remember his lectures on social anthropology, how he turned that dim room into a brilliant and profound circus of learning. He moved in an uncannily brisk manner. He swept his arm around to indicate some common term on the blackboard behind him. One felt he was presenting nothing less than an item of fantastic qualities and secret value. When he replaced his hand in the pocket of his old jacket, this fleeting magic was once again stored away at its well-worn pouch, to be retrieved at the sorcerer's discretion. We sensed he was teaching us more than we could possibly learn, and that he himself was in possession of greater and deeper knowledge than he could possibly impart. On one occasion, 
I summoned up the audacity to offer an interpretation, which was somewhat opposed to his own, regarding the tribal clowns of the Hopi Indians. I implied that personal experience as an amateur clown and special devotion to this study provided me with an insight possibly more valuable than his own. It was then he disclosed, casually and very obsedor dicta, that he had actually acted in the role of one of these masked tribal fools, and had celebrated with them the dance of the Kachinas. In revealing these facts, however, he somehow managed not to add to the humiliation I had already inflicted upon myself, and for this I was grateful to him. Foss's activities were such that he sometimes became the object of gossip or romanticized speculation. He was a field worker par excellence, and his ability to insinuate himself into exotic cultures and situations, thereby gaining insights where other anthropologists merely collected data, was renowned. At various times in his career there had been rumors of his having gone native, a la the Frank Hamilton Cushing legend. There were hints, which were not always irresponsible or cheaply glamorized, that he was involved in projects of a freakish sort, many of which focused on New England. It is a fact that he spent six months posing as a mental patient at an institution in western Massachusetts, gathering information on the culture of the psychically disturbed. When his book, Winter Solstice, The Longest Night of the Society, was published, the general opinion was that it was disappointingly subjective and impressionistic, and that, aside from a few moving but poetically obscure observations, there was nothing at all to give it value. Those who defended Thoss claimed he was a kind of super-anthropologist. While much of his work emphasized his own mind and feelings, his experience had in fact penetrated to a rich core of hard data, which he had yet to disclose in objective discourse. As a student of Thoss, I tended to support this latter estimation of him. For a variety of tenable and untenable reasons, I believe Thoss capable of unearthing hitherto inaccessible strata of human existence. So it was gratifying at first that this article entitled The Last Feast of Harlequin seemed to uphold the Thoss mystique, and in an area I personally found captivating. Much of the content of the article I did not immediately comprehend, given its author's characteristic and often strategic obscurities. On first reading, the most interesting aspect of this brief study, the notes encompassed only twenty pages, was the general mood of the piece. Thoss's eccentricities were definitely present in these pages, but only as a struggling inner force which was definitely contained, incarcerated, I might say, by the somber, rhythmic movements of his prose, and by some gloomy references he occasionally called upon. Two references in particular shared a common theme. One was a quotation from Poe's The Conqueror Worm, which Thoss employed as a rather sensational epigraph. The point of the epigraph, however, was nowhere echoed in the text of the article, save in another passing reference. Thoss brought up the well-known genesis of the modern Christmas celebration, which of course descends from the Roman Saturnalia. Then making it clear that he had not yet observed the Miracaw festival, and had only gathered its nature from various informants, he established that it too contained many, even more overt, elements of the Saturnalia. Next, he made what seemed to me a trivial and purely linguistic observation, one that had less to do with his main course of argument than it did with the equally peripheral Poe epigraph. He briefly mentioned that an early sect of the Syrian Gnostics called themselves Saturnians, and believed, among other religious heresies, that mankind was created by angels, who were in turn created by the supreme unknown. The angels, however, did not possess the power to make their creation an erect being, and for a time it crawled upon the earth like a worm. Eventually the creator remedied this grotesque state of affairs. At the time, I suppose that the symbolic correspondences of mankind's origins and ultimate condition being associated with worms, combined with a year-end festival recognizing the winter death of the earth, was the gist of this Thossian insight, a poetic but scientifically valueless observation. Other observations he made on the Miracaw festival were also strictly etic. In other words, they were based on second-hand sources, hearsay testimony. Even at that juncture, however, I felt Thoss knew more than he disclosed, and, as I later discovered, he had indeed included information on certain aspects of Miracaw, suggesting he was already in possession of several keys which, for the moment, he was keeping securely in his own pocket. 
By then, I too possessed a most revealing morsel of knowledge. A note to the Harlequin article apprised the reader that the piece was only a fragment, in rude form, of a more wide-ranging work and preparation. This work was never seen by the world. My former professor had not published anything since his withdrawal from academic circulation some twenty years ago. Now I suspected where he had gone. For the man I had stopped on the streets of Miroka, and from whom I tried to obtain directions, the man with the disconcertingly lethargic gaze, had very much resembled a superannuated version of Dr. Raymond Thoss. And now I have a confession to make. Despite my reasons for being enthusiastic about Miroka and its mysteries, especially its relationship to both Thoss and my own deepest concerns as a scholar, I contemplated the days ahead of me with no more than a feeling of frigid numbness, and often with a sense of profound depression. Yet I had no reason to be surprised at this emotional state, which had little relevance to the outward events in my life, but was determined by inward conditions that worked according to their own quite enigmatic seasons and cycles. For many years, at least since my university days, I have suffered from this dark malady, this recurrent despondency in which I would become buried when it came time for the earth to grow cold and bare and the skies heavy with shadows. Nevertheless, I pursued my plans, though somewhat mechanically, to visit Miroka during its festival days, for I superstitiously hoped that this activity might diminish the weight of my seasonal despair. In Miroka would be parades and parties and the opportunity to play the clown once again. For weeks in advance, I practiced my art, even perfecting a new feat of juggling magic, which was my special forte in foolery. I had my costumes cleaned, purchased fresh makeup, and was ready. I received permission from the university to cancel some of my classes prior to the holiday, explaining the nature of my project and the necessity of arriving in the town a few days before the festival began in order to do some preliminary research, establish informants, and so on. Actually, my plan was to postpone any formal inquiry until after the festival and to involve myself beforehand as much as possible in its activities. I would, of course, keep a journal during this time. There was one resource I did want to consult, however. Specifically, I returned to that outstate library to examine those issues of the Miraca Courier dating from December two decades ago. One story in particular confirmed a point Thoss made in the Harlequin article, though the event it chronicled must have taken place after Thoss had written his study. The Courier story appeared two weeks after the festival had ended for that year, and was concerned with the disappearance of a woman named Elizabeth Beadle, the wife of Samuel Beadle, a hotel owner in Miraca. The county authorities speculated that this was another instance of the holiday suicides which seemed to occur with inordinate seasonal regularity in the Miraca region. Thoss documented this phenomenon in his Harlequin article, though I suspected that today these deaths would be neatly categorized under the heading Seasonal Affective Disorder. In any case, the authorities searched a half-frozen lake near the outskirts of Miraca, where they had found many successful suicides in years past. This year, however, no body was discovered. Alongside the article was a picture of Elizabeth Beadle. Even in the grainy microfilm reproduction, one could detect a certain vibrancy and vitality in Mrs. Beadle's face. That a hypothesis of holiday suicide should be so readily posited to explain her disappearance seems strange and in some way unjust. Foss, in his brief article, wrote that every year changes occurred of a moral or spiritual cast which seemed to affect Miraca, along with the usual winter metamorphosis. He was not precise about its origin or nature, but stated, in typically mystifying fashion, that the effect of this sub-season on the town was conspicuously negative. In addition to the number of suicides actually accomplished during this time, there was also a rise in treatment of hypochondriacal conditions, which was how the medical men of twenty years past characterized these cases and discussions with Thoss. This state of affairs would gradually worsen and finally reach a climax during the days scheduled for the Miracaw Festival. Thoss speculated that given the secretive nature of small towns, the situation was probably even more intensely pronounced than casual investigation could reveal. The connection between the festival and this insidious sub-seasonal climate in Miracaw 
was a point on which Thos did not come to any rigid conclusions. He did write, nevertheless, that these two climatic aspects had a parallel existence in the town's history as far back as available records could document. A late 19th century history of Miracaw County speaks of the town by its original name of New Colstead, and castigates the townspeople for holding a ribald and soulless feast, to the exclusion of normal Christmas observances. Thos comments that the historian had mistakenly fused two distinct aspects of the season, their actual relationship being essentially antagonistic. The Harlequin article did not trace the festival to its earliest appearance. This may not have been possible, though Thos emphasized the New England origins of Miracaw's founders. The festival, therefore, was one imported from this region, and could reasonably be extended at least a century, that is, if it had not been brought over from the old world, in which case its roots would surely become indefinite until further research could be done. Surely Thos's allusion to the Syrian Gnostics suggested the latter possibility could not entirely be ruled out. But it seemed to be the festival's link to New England that nourished Thos's speculations. He wrote of this patch of geography as if it were an acceptable place to end the search. For him, the very words New England seemed to be stripped of all traditional connotations, and had simply come to imply nothing less than a gateway to all lands, both known and suspected, and even to ages beyond the civilized history of the region. Having been educated partly in New England, I could somewhat understand this sentimental exaggeration, for indeed there are places that seem archaic beyond chronological measure, appearing to transcend relative standards of time and achieving a kind of absolute antiquity which cannot be logically fathomed. But how this vague suggestion related to the small town in the Midwest I could not imagine. Thos himself observed that the residents of Miracaw did not portray any mysteriously primitive consciousness. On the contrary, they appeared superficially unaware of the genesis of their winter merrymaking. That such a tradition had endured through the years, however, even eclipsing the conventional Christmas holiday, revealed a profound awareness of the festival's meaning and function. I cannot deny that what I had learned about the Miracaw festival inspired me with a trite sense of fate, especially given the involvement of such an important figure from my past as Thos. It was the first time in my academic career that I knew myself to be better suited than anyone else to discern the true meaning of scattered data, even if I could only attribute this special authority to chance circumstances. Nevertheless, as I sat in that library on a morning in mid-December, I doubted for a moment the wisdom of setting out for Miracaw rather than returning home, where the more familiar right de passage of winter depression awaited me. My original scheme was to avoid the cyclical blues the season held for me, but it seemed this was also a part of the history of Miracaw, only on a much larger scale. My emotional instability, however, was exactly what qualified me most for the particular field work ahead, though I did not take pride or consolation in the fact. And to retreat would have been to deny myself an opportunity that might never offer itself again. In retrospect, there seems to have been no fortuitous resolution to the decision I had to make. As it happened, I went ahead to the town. Just past noon, on December 18th, I started driving toward Miracaw. A blur of dull, earthen-colored scenery extended in every direction. The snowfalls of late autumn had been sparse, and only a few white patches appeared in the harvested fields along the highway. The clouds were gray and abundant. Passing by a stretch of forest, I noticed the black, ragged clumps of abandoned nests clinging to the twisted mesh of bare branches. I thought I saw black birds skittering over the road ahead but they were only dead leaves, and they flew into the air as I drove by. I approached Miracaw from the south, entering the town from the direction I had left it on my visit the previous summer. This took me once again through that part of town which seemed to exist on the wrong side of some great invisible barrier dividing the desirable sections of Miracaw from the undesirable. As lurid as this district had appeared to me under the summer sun, in the thin light of that winter afternoon, it degenerated into a pale phantom of itself. The frail stores and starved-looking houses suggested a borderline region between the material and non-material worlds, with one sardonically wearing the mask of the other. 
I saw a few gaunt pedestrians who turned as I passed by, though seemingly not because I passed by, making my way up to the main street of Miroka. Driving up the steep rise of Townsend Street, I found the sights there comparatively welcoming. The rolling avenues of the town were in readiness for the festival. Streetlights had their poles raveled with evergreen, the fresh boughs proudly conspicuous in a barren season. On the doors of many of the businesses on Townsend Street were holly wreaths, equally green but observably plastic. However, although there was nothing unusual in this traditional greenery of the season, it soon became apparent to me that Miracaw had quite abandoned itself to this particular symbol of Yuletide. It was garishly in evidence everywhere. The windows of stores and houses were framed in green lights. Green streamers hung down from storefront awnings and the beacons of the Red Rooster Bar were peacock-green floodlights. I supposed the residents of Miracaw desired these decorations, but the effect was one of excess. An eerie emerald haze permeated the town, and faces looked slightly reptilian. At the time, I assumed that the prodigious evergreen, holly wreaths, and colored lights, if only of a single color, demonstrated an emphasis on the vegetable symbols of the Nordic Yuletide, which would inevitably be muddled into the winter festival of any northern country, just as they had been adopted for the Christmas season. In his Harlequin article, Foss wrote of the pagan aspect of Mirkoff's festival, likening it to the ritual of a fertility cult, with probable connections to Sithonic divinities at some time in the past. But Thos had mistaken, as I had, what was only part of the festival's significance for the whole. The hotel at which I had made reservations was located on Townsend. It was an old building of brown brick with an arched doorway and a pathetic coping intended to convey an impression of neoclassicism. I found a parking space in front and left my suitcases in the car. When I first entered the hotel lobby, it was empty. I thought perhaps the Miracaw Festival would have attracted enough visitors to at least bolster the business of its only hotel, but it seemed I was mistaken. Tapping a little bell, I leaned on the desk and turned to look at a small, traditionally decorated Christmas tree on a table near the entranceway. It was complete with shiny, egg-fragile bulbs, miniature candy canes, flat, laughing Santas with arms wide, a star on top nodding awkwardly against the delicate shoulder of an upper branch, and colored lights that bloomed out of flower-shaped sockets. For some reason, this seemed to me a sorry little piece. May I help you? said a young woman, arriving from a room adjacent to the lobby. I must have been staring rather intently at her, for she looked away and seemed quite uneasy. I could hardly imagine what to say to her, or how to explain what I was thinking. In person, she immediately radiated a chilling brilliance of manner and expression. But if this woman had not committed suicide twenty years before, as the newspaper article had suggested, neither had she aged in that time. Sarah, called a masculine voice, from the invisible heights of the stairway. A tall, middle-aged man came down the steps. I thought you were in your room, said the man, whom I took to be Samuel Beadle. Sarah, not Elizabeth Beadle, glanced sideways in my direction to indicate to her father that she was conducting the business of the hotel. Beadle apologized to me, and then excused the two of them for a moment while they went off to one side to continue their exchange. I smiled and pretended everything was normal, while trying to remain within earshot of their conversation. They spoke in tones that suggested their conflict was a familiar one, Beetle's overprotective concern with his daughter's whereabouts, and Sarah's frustrated understanding of certain restrictions placed upon her. The conversation ended, and Sarah ascended the stairs, turning for a moment to give me a facial pantomime of apology for the unprofessional scene that had just taken place. Now, sir, what can I do for you? Beetle asked, almost demanded. Yes, I have a reservation. Actually, uh, I'm a day early, if that doesn't present a problem. I gave the hotel the benefit of the doubt that its business might have been secretly flourishing. No problem at all, sir, he said, presenting me with the registration form, and then a brass-colored key dangling from a plastic disc bearing the number 44. Luggage? Yes, it's in my car. I'll give you a hand with that. While Beetle was settling me in my fourth-floor room, 
it seemed an opportune moment to broach the subject of the festival, the holiday suicides, and perhaps, depending on his reaction, the fate of his wife. I needed a respondent who had lived in the town for a good many years, and who could enlighten me about the attitude of Miracovians toward their season of sea-green lights. This is just fine, I said, about the clean but somber room. Nice view. I can see the bright green lights of Miraca just fine from up here. Is the town usually all decked out like this? For the festival, I mean. Yes, sir, for the festival, he replied mechanically. I imagine you'll probably be getting quite a few of us out-of-towners in the next couple days. Could be. Is there anything else? Yes, there is. I wonder if you could tell me something about the festivities. Such as... Well, you know, the clowns, and so forth. Only clowns here are the ones that are... Well, picked out, I suppose you would say. I don't understand. Excuse me, sir, I'm very busy right now. Is there anything else? I could think of nothing at the moment to perpetuate our conversation. Beetle wished me a good stay and left. I unpacked my suitcases. In addition to regular clothing, I had also brought along some of the items from my clown's wardrobe. Beetle's comment that the clowns of Miraca were picked out left me wondering exactly what purpose these street masqueraders served in the festival. The clown figure has had so many meanings in different times and cultures. The jolly, well-loved joker familiar to most people is actually but one aspect of this protein creature. Madmen, hunchbacks, amputees, and other abnormals were once considered natural clowns. They were elected to fulfill a comic role which could allow others to see them as ludicrous rather than as terrible reminders of the forces of disorder in the world. But sometimes a cheerless gesture was required to draw attention to this same disorder as in the case of King Lear's morbid and honest fool, who of course was eventually hanged, and so much for his clownish wisdom. Clowns have often had ambiguous and sometimes contradictory roles to play. Thus I knew enough to not to brashly jump into costume and cry out, Here I am again! That first day in Miraca, I did not stray far from the hotel. I read and rested for a few hours, and then ate in a nearby diner. Through the window beside my table, I watched the winter night turn the soft green glow of the town into a harsh and almost totally new color as it contrasted with the darkness. The streets of Miraca seemed to me unusually busy for a small town at evening. Yet it was not the kind of activity one normally sees before an approaching Christmas holiday. This was not a crowd of bustling shoppers loaded with bright bags of presents. Their arms were empty their hands shoved deep in their pockets against the cold, which nevertheless had not driven them to the solitude of their presumably warm houses. I watched them enter and exit store after store without buying anything. Many merchants remained open late, and even the places that were closed had left their neon signs illuminated. The faces that passed the window of the diner were possibly just stiffened by the cold, I thought, frozen into deep frowns and nothing else. In the same window, I saw the reflection of my own face. It was not the face of an adept clown. It was slack and flabby, and at that moment seemed the face of someone less than alive. Outside was the town of Miraca, its streets dipping and rising with a lunatic severity, its citizens packing the sidewalks, its heart bathed in green, as promising a field of professional and personal challenge as I had ever encountered and I was bored to the point of dread. I hurried back to my hotel room. Miraca has another coldness within its cold, I wrote in my journal that night. Another set of buildings and streets that exists behind the visible town's facade, like a world of disgraceful back alleys. I went on like this for about a page, across which I finally engraved a big X. Then I went to bed. In the morning, I left my car at the hotel and walked toward the main business district a few blocks away. Mingling with the good people of Miraca seemed like the proper thing to do at that point in my scientific sojourn. But as I began laboriously walking up Townsend, the sidewalks were cramped with wandering pedestrians. A glimpse of someone suddenly replaced my haphazard plan with a more specific and immediate one. Through the crowd, and about fifteen paces ahead, was my goal. 
Dr. Thos, I called. His head almost seemed to turn and look back in response to my shout, but I could not be certain. I pushed past several warmly wrapped bodies and green scarfed necks, only to find that the object of my pursuit appeared to be maintaining the same distance from me, though I did not know if this was being done deliberately or not. At the next corner, the dark-coated Thos abruptly turned right onto a steep street, which led downward directly toward the dilapidated south end of Miracaw. When I reached the corner, I looked down the sidewalk and could see him very clearly from above. I also saw how he managed to stay so far ahead of me in a mob that had impeded my own progress. For some reason, the people on the sidewalk made room so that he could move past them easily, without the usual jostling of bodies. It was not a dramatic physical avoidance, though it seemed nonetheless intentional. Fighting the tight fabric of the throng, I continued to follow Thos, losing and regaining sight of him. By the time I reached the bottom of the sloping street, the crowd had thinned out considerably, and after walking a block or so farther, I found myself practically a lone pedestrian, pacing behind a distant figure that I hoped was still Thos. He was now walking quite swiftly, and in a way that seemed to acknowledge my pursuit of him, though really it felt as if he were leading me as much as I was chasing him. I called his name a few more times at a volume he could not have failed to hear, assuming that deafness was not one of the changes to have come over him. He was, after all, not a young man, or even a middle-aged one any longer. Thos suddenly crossed in the middle of the street. He walked a few more steps and entered a signless brick building between a liquor store and a repair shop of some kind. In the Harlequin article, Thos had mentioned that the people living in this section of Miracaw maintained their own businesses and that these were patronized almost exclusively by residents of the area. I could well believe this statement when I looked at these little sheds of commerce, for they had the same badly weathered appearance as their clientele. The formidable shoddiness of these buildings notwithstanding, I followed Thos into the plain brick shell of what had been, or possibly still was, a diner. Inside it was unusually dark. Even before my eyes made the adjustment, I sensed that this was not a thriving restaurant, cozily cluttered with chairs and tables, as was the establishment where I had eaten the night before, but a place with only a few disarranged furnishings, and very cold. It seemed colder, in fact, than the winter streets outside. Dr. Thos, I called, toward a table near the center of the long room. Perhaps four or five were sitting around the table, with some others blending into the dimness behind them. Scattered across the tabletop were some books and loose papers. Seated there was an old man, indicating something in the pages before him, but it was not Thos. Beside him were two youths, whose wholesome features distinguished them from the grim weariness of the others. I approached the table, and they all looked up at me. None of them showed a glimmer of emotion, except the two boys, who exchanged worried and guilt-ridden glances with each other, as if they had just been discovered in some shameful act. They both suddenly burst from the table and ran into the dark background, where a light appeared briefly as they exited by a back door. I'm sorry, I said diffidently. I thought I saw someone I knew come in here. They said nothing. Out of a back room, others began to emerge, no doubt interested in the source of the commotion. In a few moments, the room was crowded with these tramp-like figures, all of them gazing emptily in the dimness. I was not at this point frightened of them, at least, I was not afraid they would do me any physical harm. Actually, I felt as if it was quite within my power to pummel them easily into submission, their mousy faces almost inviting a succession of firm blows. But there were so many of them. They slid slowly toward me in a wormy mass. Their eyes seemed empty and unfocused, and I wondered a moment if they were even aware of my presence. Nevertheless, I was the center upon which their lethargic shuffling converged, their shoes scuffing softly along the bare floor. I began to deliver a number of hasty inanities as they continued to press toward me, their weak and unexpectedly odorless bodies nudging against mine. I understood now why the people along the sidewalks seemed instinctively to avoid Thos. Unseen legs became entangled with my own. I staggered and then regained my balance. This sudden movement aroused me from a kind of mesmeric daze into which I must have fallen without being aware of it. I had intended to leave that dreary place long before events had reached such a juncture, 
but for some reason I could not focus my intention strongly enough to cause myself to act. My mind had been drifting farther away as these abject things approached. In a sudden surge of panic I pushed through their soft ranks and was outside. The open air revived me to my former alertness, and I immediately started pacing swiftly up the hill. I was no longer sure that I had not simply imagined what had seemed, and at the same time did not seem, like a perilous moment. Had their movements been directed toward a harmful assault, or were they trying merely to intimidate me? As I reached the green-glazed main street of Miraca, I really could not determine what had just happened. The sidewalks were still jammed with a multitude of pedestrians, who now seemed more lively than they had been only a short time before. There was a kind of vitality that could only be attributed to the imminent festivities. A group of young men had begun celebrating prematurely and strode noisily across the street at midpoint, obviously intoxicated. From the laughter and joking among the still sober citizens, I gathered that, Mardi Gras style, public drunkenness was within the traditions of this winter festival. I looked for anything to indicate the beginnings of the street masquerade, but saw nothing. No brightly garbed harlequins or snow-white pierrots. Were the ceremonies even now in preparation for the coronation of the Winter Queen? The Winter Queen, I wrote in my journal, figure of fertility, invested with symbolic powers of revival and prosperity, elected in the manner of a high school prom queen, check for possible consort figure in the form of a representative from the underworld. In the pre-darkness hours of December 19th, I sat in my hotel room and wrote and thought and organized. I did not feel too badly, all things considered. The holiday excitement which was steadily rising in the streets below my window was definitely infecting me. I forced myself to take a short nap in anticipation of a long night. When I awoke, Miracaw's annual feast was in full motion. Practically bounding from my bed to the sounds of bustling and carousing outside, I went to the window and looked out over the town. It seemed all the lights of Miracaw were shining, save in that section down the hill, which became part of the black void of winter. And now the town's greenish tinge was even more pronounced, spreading everywhere like a great green rainbow that had melted from the sky and endured, phosphorescent into the night. In the streets was the brightness of an artificial spring. The byways of Miracaw vibrated with activity. On a nearby corner, a brass band blared. Marauding cars blew their horns and were sometimes mounted by laughing pedestrians. A man emerged from the red rooster bar, threw up his arms, and crowed. I looked closely at the individual celebrants, searching for the vestments of clowns. Soon, delightedly, I saw them. The costume was red and white, with matching cap, and the face painted a noble alabaster. It almost seemed to be a clownish incarnation of that white-bearded and black-booted Christmas fool. This particular fool, however, was not receiving the affection and respect usually accorded to a Santa Claus. My poor fellow clown was in the middle of a circle of revelers who were pushing him back and forth from one to the other. The object of this abuse seemed to accept it somewhat willingly, but this little game nevertheless appeared to have humiliation as its purpose. Only clowns here are the ones that are picked out, echoed Beetle's voice in my memory. Picked on seemed closer to the truth. Packing myself in some heavy clothes, I went out into the green, gleaming streets. Not far from the hotel, I was stumbled into by a character with a wide blue and red grin and bright, baggy clothes. Actually, he had been shoved in my direction by some young men outside a drugstore. He lost his footing on the slick sidewalk and tumbled down into a bank of snow along the street. See the freak, said an obese and drunken fellow. See the freak fall. My first response was anger, and then fear as I saw two others flanking the fat drunk. They walked toward me, and I tensed myself for a confrontation. This is a disgrace, one said the neck of a wine bottle held loosely in his left hand. But it was not to me they were speaking, it was to the clown. His three persecutors helped him up with a sudden jerk, and then splashed wine in his face. They ignored me altogether. Let him loose, the fat one said. Crawl away, freak! Oh, he flies! The clown trotted off, becoming lost in the throng. Wait a minute, I said to the rowdy trio, who had started lumbering away. 
I quickly decided that it would probably be futile to ask them to explain what I had just witnessed, especially amid the noise and confusion of the festivities. In my best jovial fashion, I proposed we all go someplace, where I could buy them each a drink. They had no objection, and in a short while we were all squeezed around a table in the Red Rooster. Soon after we were served, I told them that I was from out of town, and asked if they could explain some things I did not understand about their festival. I don't think there's anything to understand, the fat one said. It's just what you see. I asked him about the people dressed as clowns. Them? They're the freaks. It's their turn this year. Everyone takes their turn. Next year might be mine. Or yours, he said, pointing at one of his friends across the table. And when we find out which one you are, you're not smart enough, said the defiant potential freak. This was an important point. The fact that individuals who played the clowns remained, or at least attempted to remain, anonymous. This arrangement would help remove inhibitions a resident of Mirakaw might have about abusing his own neighbor or even a family relation. From what I later observed, the extent of this abuse did not go beyond a kind of playful roughhousing. And even so, it was only the occasional group of rowdies who actually took advantage of this aspect of the festival, the majority of the citizens very much content to stay on the sidelines. As far as being able to illuminate the meaning of this custom, my three young friends were quite useless. To them, it was just amusement, as I imagine it was to the majority of Miracabians. This was understandable. I suppose the average person would not be able to explain exactly how the profoundly familiar Christmas holiday came to be celebrated in its present form. I left the bar alone and not unaffected by the drinks I had consumed there. Outside, the general merrymaking continued. Loud music emanated from several quarters. Miraka had fully transformed itself from a sedate small town to an enclave of Saturnalia within the dark immensity of a winter night. But Saturn is also the planetary symbol of melancholy and sterility, a clash of opposites contained within that single word. And as I wandered half-drunkenly down the street, I discovered that there was a conflict within the winter festival itself. This discovery indeed appeared to be that secret key which Thos withheld in his study of the town. Oddly enough, it was through my unfamiliarity with the outward nature of the festival that I came to know its true nature. I was mingling with the crowd on the street, warmly enjoying the confusion around me, when I saw a strangely designed creature lingering on the corner up ahead. It was one of the Miracaw clowns. Its clothes were shabby and nondescript, almost in the style of a tramp-type clown, but not humorously exaggerated enough. The face, though, made up for the lackluster costume. I had never seen such a strange conception for a clown's countenance. The figure stood beneath a dim street light, and when it turned its head my way, I felt a sense of recognition. The thin, smooth, and pale head, the wide eyes, the oval-shaped features resembling nothing so much as the skull-faced, screaming creature in that famous painting, Memory Fails Me. This clownish imitation rivaled the original, in summoning an effect of stricken horror and despair. It had an inhuman likeness, more proper to something under the earth than upon it. From the first moment I saw this creature, I thought of those inhabitants of the ghetto down the hill. There was the same nauseating passivity and languor in its bearing. Perhaps if I had not been drinking earlier, I would not have been bold enough to take the action I did. I decided to join in one of the upstanding traditions of the Winter Festival, for it annoyed me to see this morbid imposter of a clown standing up. When I reached the corner, I'd laughingly push myself into the creature, whoops, who stumbled backward and ended up on the sidewalk. I laughed again and looked around for approval from my fellow merrymakers in the vicinity. No one, however, seemed to appreciate or even acknowledge what I had done. They did not laugh with me or point with amusement, but only passed by, perhaps walking a little faster until they were some distance from the street corner incident. I realized instantly I had violated some tacit rule of behavior, though I had thought my action well within the common practice. The idea occurred to me that I might even be apprehended and prosecuted for what in any other circumstances was certainly a criminal act. 
I turned around to help the clown back to his feet, hoping to somehow redeem my offense, but the creature was gone. Solemnly, I walked away from the scene of my inadvertent crime and sought other streets away from its witnesses. Along the various back avenues of Miroka, I wandered, pausing exhaustedly at one point to sit at the counter of a small sandwich shop that was packed with customers. I ordered a cup of coffee to revive my inebriated system. Warming my hands around the cup and sipping slowly from it, I watched the people outside as they passed the front window. It was well after midnight, but the thick flow of passerby gave no indication that anyone was going home early. A carnival of profiles filed past the window, and I was content simply to sit back and observe, until finally one of these faces made me start. It was that frightful little clown I had roughed up earlier. But although its face was familiar in its ghastly aspect, there was something different about it. And I wondered that there should be two hideous freaks. Quickly paying the man at the counter, I dashed out to get a second glimpse of the clown, who was now nowhere to be seen. I wondered how it could have made its way so easily out of sight, unless the dense crowd along the sidewalk had instinctively allowed this creature to pass unhindered through its massive ranks, as it did for Thos. In the process of searching for this particular freak, I discovered that interspersed among the celebrating populace of Miraka, which included the sanctioned festival clowns, there was not one or two, but a considerable number of these pale, wrath-like creatures, and they all drifted along the streets, unmolested by even the rowdiest of revelers. I now understood one of the taboos of the festival. These other clowns were not to be disturbed, and should even be avoided much as were the residents of the slum at the edge of town. Nevertheless, I felt instinctively that the two groups of clowns were somehow identified with each other, even if the ghetto clowns were not welcome at Miraka's winter festival. Indeed, they might legitimately be regarded as part of the community and celebrating the season in their own way. To all appearances, this group of melancholy mummers constituted nothing less than an entirely independent festival, a festival within a festival. Returning to my room, I entered my suppositions into the journal I was keeping for this venture. The following are excerpts. There is a superstitiousness displayed by the residents of Miraka with regard to these people from the slum section, particularly as they lately appear in those dreadful faces signifying their own festival. What is the relationship between these simultaneous celebrations? Did one precede the other? If so, which? My opinion at this point, and I claim no conclusiveness for it, is that Miraka's winter festival is the later manifestation, that it appeared after the festival of those depressingly pallid clowns in order to cover it up or mitigate its effect. The holiday suicides come to mind, and the subclimate Thos wrote about, as well as the disappearance of Elizabeth Beetle twenty years ago, and my encounter this very day with the pariah clan existing outside yet within the community. Of my own experience with this emotionally deleterious subseason, I would rather not speak at this time. Still not able to say whether or not my usual winter melancholy is the cause. On the general subject of mental health, I must consider Thos's book about his stay in a psychiatric hospital in western Massachusetts, almost sure of that. Check on this book in Miracaw's New England roots. The winter solstice is tomorrow, albeit sometime past midnight. It is, of course, the day of the year on which night hours surpass daylight hours by the greatest margin. Note what this has to do with the suicides and a rise in psychic disorder. Recalling Thos's list of documented suicides in his article, there seem to be a recurrence of specific family names, as there very likely might be for any kind of data collected in a small town. Among these names was a beetle or two. Perhaps then there is a hereditary basis for the suicides, which has nothing to do with Thos's mystical subclimate, which is a colorful idea to be sure, and one that seems fitting for this town of various outward and inward aspects, but is not a conception that can be substantiated. One thing that seems certain, however, is the division of Miraka into two very distinct types of citizenry resulting in two festivals and the appearance of similar clowns, a term now used in an extremely loose sense. But there is a connection, and I believe I have some idea of what it is. 
I said before that the normal residents of the town regard those from the ghetto, and especially their clown figures, with superstition. Yet it's more than that. There is fear, perhaps hatred, the particular kind of hatred resulting from some powerful and irrational memory. What threatens Miraka, I think I can very well understand. I recall the incident earlier today in that vacant diner. Vacant is the appropriate word here. The congregation of that half-lit room formed less a presence than an absence, even considering the oppressive number of them. Those eyes that did not or could not focus on anything, the pining lassitude of their faces, the lazy march of their feet. I was spiritually drained when I ran out of there. I then understood why these people and their activities are avoided. I cannot question the wisdom of those ancestral Miracavians who began the tradition of the Winter Festival and gave the town a pretext for celebration and social intercourse at a time when the consequences of brooding isolation are most severe, those longest and darkest days of the solstice. A mood of Christmas joviality obviously would not be sufficient to counter the menace of this season. But even so, there are still suicides of individuals who are somehow cut off, I imagine, from the vitalizing activities of the festival. It is the nature of this insidious subseason that seems to determine the outward forms of Miracaw's winter festival. The optimistic greenery in a period of gray dormancy, the fertile promise of the winter queen, and, most interesting to my mind, the clowns. The bright clowns of Miraka who are treated so badly. They appear to serve as surrogate figures for those dark-eyed mummers of the slums. Since the latter are feared for some power or influence they possess, they may still be symbolically confronted and conquered through their counterparts, who are elected for precisely this function. If I am right about this, I wonder to what extent there is a conscious awareness among the town's populace of this indirect show of aggression. Those three young men I spoke with tonight did not seem to possess much insight, beyond seeing that there was a certain amount of robust fun in the festival's tradition. For that matter, how much awareness is there on the other side of these two antagonistic festivals? Too horrible to think of such a thing, but I must wonder if, for all their apparent aimlessness, those inhabitants of the ghetto are not the only ones who know what they are about. No denying that behind those inhumanly limp expressions, there seems to be a kind of obnoxious intelligence. As I wobbled from street to street tonight, watching those oval-mouthed clowns, I could not help feeling that all the merrymaking in Miraka was somehow allowed only by their sufferance. This, I hope, is no more than a fanciful, Thossian intuition, the sort of idea that is curious and thought-provoking without ever seeming to gain the benefit of confirmation. I know my mind is not entirely lucid, but I feel that it may be possible to penetrate Miraka's many complexities and illuminate the hidden side of the festival season. In particular, I must look for the significance of the other festival. Is it also some kind of fertility celebration? From what I have seen, the tenor of this celebrating subgroup is one of anti-fertility, if anything. How have they managed to keep from dying out completely over the years? How do they maintain their numbers? but I was too tired to formulate any more of my sodden speculations. Falling onto my bed, I soon became lost in dreams of streets and faces. I was, of course, slightly hungover when I woke up late the next morning. The festival was still going strong, and blaring music outside roused me from a nightmare. It was a parade. A number of floats proceeded down Townsend, a familiar color predominating, there were theme floats of pilgrims and Indians, cowboys and Indians, and clowns of an orthodox type. In the middle of it all was the Winter Queen herself, freezing atop an icy throne. She waved in all directions. I even imagined she waved up at my dark window. In the first few groggy moments of wakefulness, I had no sympathy with my excitation of the previous night. But I discovered that my former enthusiasm had merely lain dormant and soon returned with an even greater intensity. Never before had my mind and senses been so active during this usually inert time of year. At home I would have been playing lugubrious old records and looking out the window quite a bit. I was terribly grateful, in a completely abstract way, for my commitment to a meaningful mania, and I was eager to get to work after I had some breakfast at the coffee shop. 
When I got back to my room, I discovered the door was unlocked, and there was something written on the dresser mirror. The writing was red and greasy, as if done with a clown's makeup pencil. My own, I realized. I read the legend, or rather I should say riddle, several times. What buries itself before it is dead? I looked at it for quite a while, very shaken at how vulnerable my holiday fortifications were. Was this supposed to be a warning of some kind? A threat to the effect that if I persisted in a certain course, I would end up prematurely interred? I would have to be careful, I told myself. My resolution was to let nothing deter me from the inspired strategy I had conceived for myself. I wiped the mirror clean, for it was now needed for other purposes. I spent the rest of the day devising a very special costume and the appropriate face to go with it. I easily shabbied up my overcoat with a torn pocket or two and a complete set of stains. Combined with blue jeans and a pair of rather scuffed-up shoes, I had a passable costume for a derelict. The face, however, was more difficult, for I had to experiment from memory. Conjuring a mental image of the shrieking Perrault in that painting, the scream, I now recall, helped me quite a bit. At nightfall, I exited the hotel by the back stairway. It was strange to walk down the crowded street in this gruesome disguise. Though I thought I would feel conspicuous, the actual experience was very close, I imagined, to one of complete invisibility. No one looked at me as I strolled by, or as they strolled by, or as we strolled by each other. I was a phantom, perhaps the ghost of festivals past, or those yet to come. I had no clear idea where my disguise would take me that night, only vague expectations of gaining the confidence of my fellow specters, and possibly in some way coming to know their secrets. For a while I would simply wander around in that lackadaisical manner I had learned from them, following their lead in any way they might indicate. And for the most part this meant doing almost nothing, and doing it silently. If I passed one of my kind on the sidewalk, there was no speaking, no exchange of knowing looks, no recognition at all that I was aware of. We were there on the streets of Miraca to create a presence, and nothing more. At least, this is how I came to feel about it. As I drifted along with my bodiless invisibility, I felt myself more and more becoming an empty, floating shape, seen without being seen, and walking without the interference of those grosser creatures who shared my world. It was not an experience completely without interest and even enjoyment. The clown shibboleth of, here we are again, took on a new meaning for me, as I felt myself a novitiate of a more rarefied order of harlequinry. And very soon the opportunity to make further progress along this path presented itself. Going the opposite direction down the street, a pickup truck slowly passed, gently parting a sea of zigging and zagging celebrants. The cargo in the back of this truck was curious, for it was made up entirely of my fellow sectarians. At the end of the block, the truck stopped, and another of them boarded it over the back gate. One block down, I saw still another get on. Then the truck made a U-turn at an intersection and headed in my direction. I stood at the curb as I had seen the others do. I was not sure the truck would pick me up, thinking that somehow they knew I was an imposter. The truck did, however, slow down, almost coming to a stop when it reached me. The others were crowded on the floor of the truck bed. Most of them were just staring at nothing, with the usual indifference I had come to expect from their kind. But a few actually glanced at me with some anticipation. For a second, I hesitated, not sure I wanted to pursue this ruse any further. At the last moment, though, some impulse sent me climbing up the back of the truck and squeezing myself in among the others. There were only a few more to pick up before the truck headed for the outskirts of Miraca and beyond. At first, I tried to maintain a clear orientation with respect to the town, but as we took turn after turn through the darkness of narrow country roads, I found myself unable to preserve any sense of direction. The majority of the others in the back of the truck exhibited no apparent awareness of their fellow passengers. Guardedly, I looked from face to ghostly face. A few of them spoke in short, whispered phrases to others close by. I could not make out what they were saying, but the tone of their voices was one of innocent normalcy, as if they were not of the hardened slum herd of Miracaw. Perhaps, I thought, these were thrill-seekers who had disguised themselves as I had done, 
or, more likely, initiates of some kind. Possibly they had received prior instructions at such meetings, as I had stumbled onto the day before. It was also likely that among this crew were those very boys I had frightened into a precipitate exit from that old diner. The truck was now speeding along a fairly open stretch of country, heading toward those higher hills that surrounded the now distant town of Miraca. The icy wind whipped around us, and I could not keep myself from trembling with cold. This definitely betrayed me as one of the newcomers among the group, for the two bodies that pressed against mine were rigidly still, and even seemed to be radiating a frigidity of their own. I glanced ahead at the darkness into which we were rapidly progressing. We had left all open country behind us now, and the road was enclosed by thick woods. The mass of bodies in the truck leaned into one another as we began traveling up a steep incline. Above us at the top of the hill were lights shining somewhere within the woods. When the road leveled off, the truck made an abrupt turn, steering into what looked like a great ditch. There was an unpaved path, however, upon which the truck proceeded toward the glowing in the near distance. The glowing became brighter and sharper as we approached it, flickering upon the trees and revealing stark detail where there had formerly been only smooth darkness. As the truck pulled into a clearing and came to a stop, I saw a loose assembly of figures, many of which held lanterns that beamed with a dazzling and frosty light. I stood up in the back of the truck to onboard as the others were doing. Glancing around from that height, I saw approximately thirty more of those cadaverous clowns milling about. One of my fellow passengers spied me lingering in the truck, and in a strangely high-pitched whisper told me to hurry, explaining something about the apex of darkness. I thought again about this solstice night. It was technically the longest period of darkness of the year, even if not by a very significant margin for many other winter nights. Its true significance, though, was related to considerations having little to do with either statistics or the calendar. I went over to the place where the others were forming into a tighter crowd, which portrayed a sense of expectancy in the subtle gestures and expressions of its individual members. Glances were now exchanged, the hand of one lightly touched the shoulder of another, and a pair of circled eyes gazed over to where two figures were setting their lanterns on the ground, about six feet apart. The illumination of these lanterns revealed an opening in the earth. Eventually, the awareness of everyone was focused on this roundish pit, and as if by prearranged signal, we all began huddling around it. The only sounds were those of the wind and our own movements as we crushed frozen leaves and sticks underfoot. Finally, when we had all surrounded this gaping hole, the first one jumped in, leaving our sight for a moment, but then reappearing to take hold of a lantern which another handed him from above. The miniature abyss filled with light, and I could see it was no more than six feet deep. One of its walls opened into the mouth of a tunnel. The figure holding the lantern stooped a little and disappeared into the passage. Each one of us, in turn, dropped into the darkness of this pit, and every fifth one took a lantern. I kept to the back of the group, for whatever subterranean activities were going to take place, I was sure I wanted to be on their periphery. When only about ten of us remained on the ground above, I maneuvered to let four of them precede me so that I might receive a lantern. This was exactly how it worked out, for after I had leapt to the bottom of the hole, a light was ritually handed down to me. Turning about face, I quickly entered the passageway. At that point, I shook so with cold that I was neither curious nor afraid, grateful for the shelter. I entered a long, gently sloping tunnel, just high enough for me to stand upright. It was considerably warmer down there than outside in the cold darkness of the woods. After a few moments, I had sufficiently thawed out so that my concerns shifted from those of physical comfort to a sudden and justified preoccupation with my survival. As I walked, I held my lantern close to the sides of the tunnel. They were relatively smooth, as if the passage had not been made by manual digging, but had been burrowed by something which left behind a clue to its dimensions and the tunnel's size and shape. This delirious idea came to me when I recalled the message that had been left on my hotel room mirror. What buries itself before it is dead? I had to hurry along to keep up with those uncanny spelunkers who preceded me. The lanterns ahead bobbed with every step of their bearers, 
the lumbering procession seeming less and less real the farther we marched into that snug little tunnel. At some point, I noticed the line ahead of me growing shorter. The processioners were emptying out into a cavernous chamber where I, too, soon arrived. This area was about thirty feet in height, its other dimensions approximating those of a large ballroom. Gazing into the distance above made me uncomfortably aware of how far we had descended into the earth. Unlike the smooth sides of the tunnel, the walls of this cavern looked jagged and irregular, as though they had been gnawed at. The earth had been removed, I assumed, either through the tunnel from which we had emerged, or else by way of one of the many other black openings that I saw around the edges of the chamber, for possibly they too led back to the surface. But the structure of this chamber occupied my mind a great deal less than did its occupants. There to meet us on the floor of the great cavern was what must have been the entire slum population of Miracaw, and more, all with the same eerily wide-eyed and oval-mouthed faces. They formed a circle around an altar-like object, which had some kind of dark, leathery covering draped over it. Upon the altar, another covering of the same material concealed a lumpy form beneath and behind this form, looking down upon the altar, was the only figure whose face was not greased with makeup. He wore a long, snowy robe that was the same color as the wispy hair berimming his head. His arms were calmly at his sides. He made no movement. The man I once believed would penetrate great secrets stood before us, with the same professorial bearing that had impressed me so many years ago. Yet now I felt nothing but dread at the thought of what revelations lay pocketed within the abysmal folds of his magisterial attire. Had I really come here to challenge such a formidable figure? The name by which I knew him seemed itself insufficient to designate one of his stature. Rather, I should name him by his other incarnations. God of all wisdom, scribe of all sacred books, father of all magicians, thrice great and more. Rather, I should call him Thoth. He raised his cupped hands to his congregation, and the ceremony was underway. It was all very simple. The entire assembly, which had remained speechless until this moment, broke into the most horrendous, high-pitched singing that can be imagined. It was a choir of sorrow, lament, and mortification. The cavern rang with the dissonant, whining chorus. My voice, too, was added to the congregations, trying to blend with their maimed music. But my singing could not imitate theirs, having a huskiness at odds with the keening ululation of that company. To keep from exposing myself as an intruder, I continued to mouth their words without sound. These words were a revelation of the moody malignancy, which until then I had no more than sensed whenever in the presence of these figures. They were singing to the unborn in paradise, to the pure, unlived lives. They sang a dirge for existence, for all its vital forms and seasons. Their ideal was a melancholy half-existence, consecrated to all the many shapes of death and dissolution. A sea of thin, bloodless faces trembled and screamed their antipathy to being itself. And the robed, guiding figure at the heart of all this elevated over the course of twenty years to the status of high priest, was the man from whom I had taken so many of my own life's principles. It would be useless to describe what I felt at that moment, and a waste of the time I need to describe the events which followed. The singing abruptly stopped, and the towering white-haired figure began to speak. He was welcoming those of the new generation. Twenty winters had passed since the pure ones had expanded their ranks. The word pure in this setting was a violence to what sense and composure I still retained, for nothing could have been more foul than what was to come. Thos, and I employ this defunct identity only as a convenience, closed his sermon and drew closer to the dark-skinned altar. Then, with all the flourish of his former life, he drew back the topmost covering. Beneath it was a limp-limbed effigy, a collapsed puppet sprawled upon the slab. I was standing toward the rear of the congregation, and attempted to keep as close to the exit passage as I could. Thus, I did not see everything as clearly as I might have. Thos looked down upon the crooked, doll-like form, and then out at the gathering. 
I even imagined that he made knowing eye contact with me. He spread his arms and a stream of continuous and unintelligible words flowed from his moaning mouth. The congregation began to stir, not greatly, but perceptibly. Until that moment, there was a limit to what I believed was the evil of these people. They were, after all, only that. They were merely morbid souls with beliefs that were eccentric to the healthy social order around them. If there was anything I had learned in all my years as an anthropologist, it was that the world is infinitely rich in phenomena that society as we know it, whoever we might be, would regard as strange, even to the point where the concept of strangeness itself had little meaning for me. But with the scene I then witnessed, my conscience vaulted into a realm from which it will never return. For now was the transformation scene, the culmination of every harlequinade. It began slowly. There was increasing movement among those on the far side of the chamber from where I stood. Someone had fallen to the floor, and the others in the area backed away. The voice at the altar continued chanting. I tried to gain a better view, but there were too many of them around me. Through the mass of obstructing bodies, I caught only glimpses of what was taking place. The one who had swooned to the floor of the chamber seemed to be losing all former shape and proportion. I thought it was a clown's trick. They were clowns, were they not? I myself could make four white balls transform into four black balls as I juggled them, and this was not my most astonishing feat of clownish magic. And is there not always a slate of hand, inherent in all ceremonies? often dependent on the transported delusions of the celebrants. This was a good show, I thought, and giggled to myself. The transformation scene of Harlequin throwing off his fool's facade. Oh, God, Harlequin, do not move like that. Harlequin, where are your arms? And your legs have melted together and begun squirming upon the floor. What horrible mouthing umbilicus is that where your face should be? What is it that buries itself before it is dead? The almighty serpent of wisdom, the conqueror worm. It now started happening all around the chamber. Individual members of the congregation would gaze emptily, caught for a moment in a frozen trance, and then collapse to the floor to begin the sickening metamorphosis. This happened with ever-increasing frequency, the louder and more frantically Thos chanted his insane prayer or curse. Then there began a writhing movement toward the altar, and Thos welcomed the things as they curled their way to the altar top. I knew now what lax figure lay upon it. This was Cora and Persephone, the daughter of Ceres and the Winter Queen, the child abducted into the underworld of death. Except this child had no supernatural mother to save her, no living mother at all for the sacrifice I witnessed was an echo of one that had occurred twenty years before, the carnival feast of the preceding generation. Oh, carnival! Now both mother and father had become victims of this subterranean sabbat. I finally realized this truth when the figure stirred upon the altar, lifted its head of icy beauty, and screamed at the sight of mute mouths closing around her. I ran from the chamber into the tunnel. There was nothing else that could be done, I have obsessively told myself. Some of the others who had not yet changed began to pursue me. They would have caught up to me, too, I have no doubt, for I fell only a few yards into the passage, and for a moment I imagined that I, too, was about to undergo a transformation. Anything seemed possible now. When I heard the approaching footsteps of my pursuers, I was sure there was nothing left for me but the worst finale a human being can suffer the death known to those whom the gods have first made mad. Perhaps I would even be forced to take a place on the altar among the gory remnants of the Winter Queen. But the footsteps behind me ceased and retreated. They had received an order in the voice of their high priest. I, too, heard the order, though I wish I had not, for until then I had imagined that Thos did not remember who I was. It was that voice which taught me otherwise. For the moment, I was free to leave. I struggled to my feet and, having broken my lantern in the fall, retraced my way back through cloacal blackness. Everything seemed to happen very quickly once I emerged from the tunnel and climbed up from the pit. I wiped the reeking grease paint from my face as I ran through the woods and back to the road. A passing car stopped 
though I gave it no other choice except to run me down. Thank you for stopping. What the hell are you doing out here? The driver asked. I caught my breath. It was a joke. The festival. Friends thought it would be funny. Please drive on. My ride let me off about a mile out of town, and from there I could find my way. It was the same route I traveled when I first visited Mirakaw the summer before. I stood for a while, at the summit of that high hill, just outside the city limits, looking down upon the busy little hamlet. The intensity of the festival had not abated. I walked toward the welcoming glow of green and slipped through the festivities unnoticed. When I reached the hotel, I was glad to see that no one was about. Given that I was so obviously a wreck, I feared meeting anyone who might ask what had happened to me. The hotel desk was unattended, so I was spared having to speak with Beetle. Indeed, there was an atmosphere of abandonment throughout the place that I found ominous, yet did not pause to contemplate. I trod up the stairs to my room. Walking the door behind me, I then collapsed upon the bed and was soon enshrouded by a merciful blackness. When I awoke the next morning, I saw from my window that the town and surrounding countryside had been visited during the night by a heavy snowfall, one which was entirely unpredicted. A few leftover flakes were still lighting on the now deserted streets of Mirakaw, and buried beneath the drifts below were the last vestiges of revelry and celebration. The festival was over. Everyone had retired to their homes. And this was exactly my own intention. Any action on my part concerning what I had seen the night before would have to wait until I was away from the town. I am still not sure it will do the slightest good to speak up like this. Any accusations I have made with respect to the slum populace of Mirakaw are eminently subject to dismissal, perhaps as a hoax or a festival hallucination, and thereafter this document will take its place alongside the works of Raymond Thoss. With packed suitcase in both hands, I walked up to the front desk to check out. The man behind the desk was not Samuel Beetle, and he had to fumble around to find my bill. Here we are. Everything all right? Fine, I answered in a dead voice. Is Mr. Beetle around? No, I'm afraid he's not back yet. Been out all night looking for his daughter. She's a very popular girl, being the Winter Queen and all that nonsense. Probably find she was at a party somewhere. A little noise came out of my throat. I threw my suitcases in the back seat of my car and got behind the wheel. On that morning, nothing I could recall seemed real to me. The snow was falling and I watched it through my windshield, slow and silent and entrancing. I started up my car, routinely glancing in my rearview mirror. What I saw there is now vividly framed in my mind, as it was framed in the back window of my car when I turned to verify its reality. In the middle of the street behind me, standing ankle-deep in snow, were Thos and another figure. When I looked closely at the other, I recognized him, as one of the boys whom I surprised in that diner. But he had now taken on a listless resemblance to his new family. Both he and Thos stared at me, making no attempt to forestall my departure. Thos knew that this was unnecessary. I had to carry the image of those two dark figures in my mind as I drove back home. And only now has the full gravity of my experience descended upon me. So far I have claimed illness in order to avoid my teaching schedule. To face the normal flow of life as I had formerly known it would be impossible. I am now very much under the influence of a season and a climate far colder and more barren than all the winters in human memory. And mentally retracing past events does not seem to have helped. If anything, I now feel myself sinking deeper into a velvety white abyss. At certain times, I could almost dissolve entirely into this inner realm of purity and emptiness, the paradise of the unborn. I remember how I was momentarily overtaken by a feeling I had never known when in disguise I drifted through the streets of Mirica, untouched by the drunken, noisy forms around me, untouchable. It was the feeling that I had been liberated from the weight of life. But I recoil at this seductive nostalgia, for it mocks my existence as mere foolery, a bright clown's mask behind which I have sought to hide my darkness. I realize what is happening and what I do not want to be true, 
though Thos proclaimed it was. I recall his command to those others, as I lay helplessly prone in the tunnel. They could have apprehended me, but Thos, my old master, called them back. His voice echoed throughout that cavern, and it now reverberates within the psychic chambers of my memory. He is one of us, it said. He has always been one of us. It is this voice which now fills my dreams and my days and my long winter nights. I have seen you, Dr. Thos, through the snow outside my window. Soon I will celebrate, alone, that last feast which will kill your words, only to prove how well I have learned their truth. To the memory of H.P. Lovecraft.